Eight years ago, SRAM released the first one by specific drivetrain. I remember Nino Scherter winning on it within weeks of it being shown to the public, which was an early sign that one by was going to pave the way for drivetrains to come. Fast forward to 2020, and one by drivetrains feature on a large percentage of bikes. According to my Bikepacking Bike Buyer's Guide, it's two thirds of all 27.5 inch gravel bikes and close to 100% of mountain bikes. So, are one by systems the ultimate drivetrain, or is there still a place for two by and three by? Today, we are going to analyze every aspect of bicycle drivetrains. We will be looking at all data available across eight different categories to find out once and for all which drivetrain is best. Number one, drive resistance. Velo News has lab tested the resistance for both one by and two by drivetrains, and the conclusion is clear. Two by is the most efficient across all gears. The main reason for the higher resistance is greater chain angles from the chainring to the cassette, which results in the chain plates scraping harder on the cogs. But additionally, when you use the smaller chainrings and cogs found on a one by system, the chain tension is higher, the chain speed or tooth interactions per minute is faster, and a chain has to articulate more to wrap around the smaller cogs. The result is about two watts less drivetrain efficiency on average, but it's four to six watts in the three highest gears. That said, there is also data available suggesting that SRAM chains run slower than Shimano chains, so the number might be a touch less. Number two, gear steps. Cadence is the number of times your crank spin per minute when you ride. And just like your car engine, you'll have an ideal RPM range where you can pedal efficiently. My preference is to pedal along at somewhere between 80 and 90 RPM. In an ideal world, our cadence would remain constant as we increase in speed, but this is not possible on a bike with gears. The next best thing is to make the difference between gear changes as small as possible, so you can stay in your optimal RPM range for longer. We can do this by minimizing the gear steps between each cog on a cassette. Most cassettes used for touring and bikepacking have 13 to 15% gear steps. You'll notice there isn't a huge difference between 1136 and 1142 cassettes because the latter offers an extra gear to account for the 42 tooth cog. But gear steps are pretty abstract, so I prefer to graph them using cadence differences. These graphs show the specific range of speeds for each gear between two selected RPMs. A crossover in the graph signifies a smaller cadence difference than those selected, while any gap in the graph results in a bigger cadence difference. At my typical cadence, an upshift on a 1x12 drivetrain will slow my cadence by 13 RPM. Comparatively, my cadence will slow by 11 RPM using a 2x11 or 3x10 drivetrain, allowing me to stay between 80 and 90 RPM for longer. Number three, gear range. Your bike's gear range, which is measured as a percentage, determines the speeds at which you can pedal your bike. It was not that long ago when one by drivetrains were limited to 420%, but these days there is much less of a difference in gear range between all drivetrains. A great way to visualize gear range is to peg the lowest gear at a set speed for all drivetrains and then calculate what the top speed will be. In this example, the one by bikes top out at 47 to 48 kilometers per hour in their highest gear, while a two by or three by bike will offer 15 to 20% more speed, topping out at 50 56 to 57 kilometers per hour. Number four, availability and compatibility. As I specialize in bike travel, parts availability and compatibility are two important aspects of any drivetrain for me. Speaking of which, if you want to learn everything about bikes, definitely check out the Bikepacking Bike Buyer's Guide or Touring Bicycle Buyer's Guide, which are linked in the description. Available spare parts usually go hand in hand with the bikes that shops sell. You can find $800 mountain bikes in the capital cities of most countries, which are now specced with 10-speed drivetrains, and bikes that are not much more expensive come with 11-speed components too. In comparison, 12-speed parts are harder to come by in low-income countries, but I suspect that won't be for long. While 8, 9, 10 and 11-speed drivetrain users can mix and match between brands without much concern, 12-speed SRAM uses oversized chain rollers to mate with their cassettes, and 12-speed Shimano only really works well with Shimano. 
Number five, chain longevity. There is a misconception that newer, narrower chains often found on one-by drivetrains are not as durable as older chains. Zero friction cycling has done a lot of testing in this space and has found that 12-speed chains are actually the most durable chains ever created. And not by a small margin either. More than 30 chains have been tested by Adam on a converted smart trainer with lubrication and contamination controlled. The test is stopped when the chain reaches 0.5% wear, as this is the point where the chain starts to accelerate the wear on your cassette and chain rings. High quality 12 speed chains are lasting 4 to 7,000 kilometers in this test, with equivalent 11 speed chains running closer to 3,000 kilometers, and even less longevity for chains with fewer speeds. If these numbers look a little bit low, it's because the chains were tested with contamination to simulate real-world conditions. You can reduce chain wear by riding in dry environments, by keeping your chain super clean, or by using a wax lubricant. Number 6. Price According to Zero Friction Cycling, you should get three chains to one cassette, and as many as six chains to your chain rings. By knowing when a chain will get to 0.5% wear, we can estimate the long-term running costs of different drivetrains. Assuming an environment with similar conditions to those controlled for by Zero Friction Cycling, the bikes with the front derailleurs should be the cheapest to run. Number 7. Ease of Use for a beginner, there is no doubt that a one-by drivetrain is the easiest to use. If you want to go faster, you go up a gear, and if you want to go slower, you go down. In comparison, using a two-by or three-by drivetrain takes a little more practice. To avoid cross-chaining, you'll want to use the biggest cassette cogs with the smallest front chain rings, and the smallest cassette cogs with the biggest front chain rings. Additionally, something that is easy to use should also be easy to maintain. With fewer components, one-by is the obvious winner here. Number 8. Tire clearance and shorter chain stays. The reason why one by is so widely adopted on mountain bikes often comes down to frame design. Both the front derailleur and inner chainring chain line can interfere with the rear tyre, restricting how short the chainstays of a bike can be. Usually, shorter chainstays are preferred on mountain bikes as they make it easier to lift the front wheel over obstacles, as well as making the bike feel more playful to ride. Additionally, the pivot locations and tube shapes on full suspension bikes can be limited by front derailleur infrastructure, so that's why most full suspension bikes are now exclusively one by. In this head-to-head, -head, the 2x drivetrain took home 5 points, the 3x system won 4, and the 1x setup ended up with 3. But ultimately, you'll need to pick the drivetrain that best suits the type of riding you do. The newest kit on the block, 1x, is certainly more user-friendly, and the 12-speed chain durability is incredible. For mountain bikers, 1x allows for frame designs with fewer compromises. And if you spend a lot of your time on steep terrain, the bigger gear steps will not be particularly noticeable. However, the case is as strong as ever for front derailleurs, as they will provide lower drivetrain resistance, a wider gear range, and a smaller cadence difference between each shift. If you value my bike nerd content, consider supporting my work on Patreon, Grab a book or just like and subscribe because then we can finally trick the YouTube algorithm into thinking I know what I'm talking about.